I actually was introduced to Alma Thomas's work by my wife, Sandra Tower. We um, ran in to see this lady's work at the, at the, um, the Harlem um, um, Studio Museum. There was a show in 2016 and um, the work is just buoyant and, and vibrant and seeing it large scale, seeing it in person is very important. I mean, you know, you'll, you'll get a feel for it from what's on screen, but many of these pieces are, you know, four and a half by six feet tall and some of them a lot larger than that. So the scale of the work actually has a, a very um, powerful effect. Um, one thing I'm going to say is I have a piece of misinformation on, 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 this, on this intro page. There is a new retrospective that's on its way through, working its way through the country. It is going to start out um, in, um, in Virginia. Um, and basically it's going to be at uh, Norfolk um, and I'm forgetting the name of the museum right now, but um, it's going to start out there and then it's going to work its way around and it is not going to end at the Phillips. It is going to be at the Phillips in the fall, supposedly, of 2021. Um, so it'll be in, in Washington and then it's gonna, where it's gonna close is uh, Columbus, um, Georgia, which was where she was born. So uh, what I'm gonna do is just do a little background stuff. She was really considered, uh, her mature work was really kind of considered part of the Washington Color School. Um, and I'll go into explaining what the color field painting is about and stuff like that as we get into the talk. Um, what you see on the screen right here on the, on the left is, is one of her abstractions from 1960 and a semi-representational uh, piece from um, the March on Washington, which she participated in. Um, it's, um, you know, this is, this is, let's see. Uh, all right, I'm gonna go through the bio thing, but th this was after she retired from teaching. She taught until 1960 um, and, and she retired. And after that, she began to pursue her art career full time. Um, she was born in Columbus, Georgia in 1891. Um, and they moved to Washington, the family moved to Washington, D.C. in, um, 1907. There, there were very, very heavy race, racial things going on in, in Georgia at, at that time. The Klan was very active and all that. And in order to get a better shot at education, they moved to DC in 1907. Um, and so basically she um, went to uh, Howard University and was one of the first to graduate in, um, in the art department of Howard. And that was, she graduated in 1924 with her Bachelor of Fine Arts. And then she began to teach on the junior high school level where she taught until 1960. Um, but in the, in the 30s, I think it was 34, um, she began to attend Columbia University in the summers to get her master's um, in, in art education and explored the galleries and all that, was exposed to a lot of what was going on in, in the art world at that time, which was very active. And I'm gonna move on to, let's see. Larry, 
Yes. Uh, this, um, somebody thought the museum that you were looking for is the Chrysler Museum. Would that be? Yes, it is the Chrysler. That's right. Okay. That's correct. Okay. So that's where the show is going to start. Um, right. Okay. So, you know, basically, this is this is a a picture of her um, from, you know, she must have been about. I'd say in her in her early 80s in this picture, um, and let's see. okay. Um, so this is an this is an early piece. This the one on the on the right is hers. The one on the left is Matisse. Um, you can see that that she was that she was definitely affected by him. Um, really, this color color field business um, um, is characterized by large fields of flat, solid color spread across stained canvases or spread across the field of the of the entire surface, and it's really about the interaction of color. The piece on the left, Watusi, was actually uh, chosen by the Obamas. It was one of the pieces that they had in the dining room, I believe, in the White House while they were in office. Um, it's part of the Smithsonian collection. Um, so the color field movement actually, um, it started kind of in the abstract expressionist period. Um, Rothko and and uh, Barnett Newman and Clifford Still were all really considered to be color field painters, um, uh, and I will show you examples of those as we go on with the presentation. Um, but it it really is kind of typified by large fields of flat color. Um, stain, staining, um, a kind of unbroken surface of, of the flat picture plane. Um, not so much about brush strokes, not so much about emotional impact. They're really much more interested in the interaction of color and, and how that functions. Um, so I'm going to move on. Okay, so again, here, here's, here's Matisse and his jazz, and here is Alma Thomas and in space and time. Um, her, her work, really, this, the piece on the, on the right of the screen is really a close-up of, of the rhythm that's, that's in, in that uh, in space and in time piece. Um, so you can see the influence of uh, of the notions about color that Matisse was playing with and how that affected her. Uh, let's see. And here we have um, Helen Frankenthaler on on the right, and an Alma Thomas piece from the sixties from actually 1960. Um, now, what, what happened here is, um, Clement Greenberg, who was a, um, a well-known art critic, met Morris Lewis and Kenneth Nolan, who were both kind of the founders of the, of the, the, Washington Color School. He saw what they were doing and said, you need to come up to New York and take a look at what this woman, Helen Frankenthaler, is doing. So he set up an introduction to these two younger artists to come up and, and meet Helen. And they came into the studio and they were dumbfounded. Uh, you know, basically what, what Helen Frankenthaler was doing at the time 
like this mountains and sea piece, which is what they saw. They saw this piece when they came into her studio, among others. She was pouring pigment, pouring paint onto raw canvas and letting it stain into the canvas. She was just allowing, allowing the colors to, to seep into it, into the fibers of the, of the canvas. So it was very flat. It was very much about, about um, how that paint penetrated that surface. Um, and it was, it was a lot, this was not about kind of this mythological, emotional, um, philosophical content that the abstract expressionists were really wrapped up in. They needed this rationale of a high philosophical uh, meaning behind what they were doing to rationalize what they were doing. Well, the, these folks, weren't quite there. They were more interested in the interaction of color and how and what that did. Um, so let's see. And here we have on the on the right a Rothko. And and it really is this business of 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 what's happening at the edges of those forms, where those colors meet, how how the blur of of those those massive areas of form meet the 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 rub up against the other colors and how it kind of hovers there you can see the staining you can see the the um the layering and in the alma thomas red dahlia song of the red dahlia you can see the 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 way the underpainting the the those those stains that are underneath the surface interact with those more defined forms um, so you know for for rothko there was there was still this philosophical emotional content that he was after um his work got darker and darker as he got more and more depressed as life went on for him. Uh, the, these paintings, which are just delightful color experiences in the early paintings, become more and more about gray, um, cloudy days. Uh, so Alma was always interested in the beauty, the delight, the buoyance, that interaction of color and what that did for her. You know, this is a 1976 piece, so that's, it's, it's really late in her, in her career. And this piece is from 1951 from um, Rothko, which is actually pretty early. Um, so. And now, again, this is Barnett Newman on on the on the right, and these paintings were called zip paintings, uh, and they're basically very minimal. Um, they're about the interaction between between large fields of color and what they what they do up next to each other. Um, and this is Alma Thomas's atmospheric effects. Um, it it really um, you can see how she was how she was affected by the stuff she saw. What was going on with the with the abstract expressionists and with the other color field painters? What happened in 1960? is she, when she stopped teaching and retired and started to paint full time, she went to the um, American University in, in Washington, D.C. And that's when she started to really get exposed to what other contemporary artists around her in Washington were doing, like um, 
Morris Lewis and and Kenneth Nolan, especially. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Okay. And here's a Kenneth Nolan, and you can kind of see the direct relationship between some of the ideas of these target things that Kenneth Nolan was doing and and um, this fantastic sunset of <laughs> Alma Thomas. Um, and they're, they're really kind of concentrating on simple symbols, you know, rather than being really complex, they wanted to get pared down so that the, these color things were, they're larger scale, they're, they're pretty big pieces for the most part. You know, I think, I think the Alma Thomas piece here is um, probably somewhere around five and a half by five and a half feet. Um, and again, the, the Kenneth Nolan is large, larger scale. And here's, here's a, a beautiful Morris Lewis stain painting. Now, the problem with looking at it on screen is you can't see the layers and layers of paint that went on there. But these are not just one layer of paint. They're, they're these layers of paint. And, and they have a depth and richness to them. Um, you know, Alma Thomas, these, pie these pieces, she looked at um, the mosaics. Um, actually, she, she was, you know, in, she took art history when she went, the Ameri went to the American University and, and was exposed to um, the the mosaic, the Byzantine mosaics and things like that. And that really affected her, the way those, the way that interaction of color happened in, in, in mosaic tiles. Um, let's see. Okay. And this, this school of painting, the, the color field guys were, it was it was really a broad range of painters that were that were involved in this. Um, Sam Francis um, painted in California and Japan and was exposed to what was going on in in New York and in Washington, but he was he was all over the place. The, there's there's a whole group of uh, Canadian painters, uh, by, a guy by the name of Jack Bush, and several others that were you know doing stain paintings and doing and doing large fields of color um geometric um shapes that were interacting um so you can see the the things that were kind of in the air at that time um these were both in the 70s Now, I'm gonna move on to something else that she was very much influenced by. In, in, in the late 60s, she was really um, captivated by the notion of man going into outer space, of, of, of space travel, of, um, you know, the, the celestial happenings. Um, and these, these pieces were really kind of devoted to kind of the, the astronomical um, views that, 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 were, that were seen from the space travel, like the views of the Earth from, from, uh, from the moon and, and all that. Um, so many of the actually she she really did a bunch of pieces that were based on space flight um it it really inspired her 
and um, let's see what we got here on this. Um, again, it it was it it has to do with rhythms. It has to do with 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 this pattern business. Um, And now we're talking about a really large scale piece. This Red Azalea's singing and dancing rock and roll music. This was made in 1976. This is an 81 year old lady painting this painting. It is six feet by 158. So we're talking about six by, by over uh, 14 feet. Um, this is a big painting uh, for a young person. This is a very big painting <laughs> for an 81 year old. Um, and her, her energy was just, um, you know, barely containable on this canvas. Uh, and, and she was definitely, you know, this is, this is, you know, her response to rock and roll music. Um, it's really fun. No, no. Was there any question? No. No. Okay. All right. No uh, questions. Good. Okay. All right. So again, I'm going to move on. That this business of, of the rhythms of nature of kind of that, that um, repeat pattern um the scale of the pieces that the interaction of the forms and 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 um how that how that rhythm was expressed through these through these incremental forms is something that was very important to her work and important to the other other uh painters from the Washington Color School um, and again, you know, this, this gray night phenomena, I mean, basically she was looking out at the stars and she was like, you know, just responding to that, that, that immensity and trying to capture that in, in a very minimal way. But the really, you know, the the compositional elements that are here, the 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 sense of color and 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 um, dimension of the piece, the scale of the piece is very important. Um, Larry, yes, we have yeah. a question. Okay, was she influenced by quilts of the South? Um. I, I would say yes. Um, it's something that's that's definitely in there. The business of pattern, the business of of repeat, um, increment, all that, and and of course these buoyant, beautiful colors. And again, you know this subtle business. Now you know. There's there's the business of music and the chant, the the idea of these being really meditative pieces. They're they're um, that that underpainting in this autumn leaves fluttering in the breeze. That that beautiful kind of haze of blue that's underneath these pieces and and the subtle change of color, this very minimal change of color in the in the increments that she's using to describe the leaf-like shape. Larry, we have another question. Yes. Oh, I just lost it. Um, she influenced by okay 
did she work in ceramics or te textiles? No, she did not. Not that I know of, anyway. That doesn't, that doesn't mean she didn't, but not that I know of. Um, though, though I think that there's definitely, you know, the, the business of the, of the mosaic is definitely here. And, you know, if you look at stuff like Batik and all that, that kind of crackle rhythm that happens with Batik is something that I think, you know, would, would have fed into this work. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was her, as a black woman, um, her prominence in, in, in this school of painters. Um, she at, I believe she was 81. It's either 81 or 84, um, had a, had the first um, one woman show by, by a black woman at the Whitney Museum of Art. So she gained great, um, in the, this and this was this was in the in the seventies when the when this happened. She was she was probably eighty eighty three or eighty four when when they did the show of her work. And um the piece on the on the right, um Wind and Crepe Myrtle Concerto, um this was this piece was bought by uh, Thomas Hess, who was a critic and 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 um, uh, curator, and it was donated to the Metropolitan Museum. So her work is in the Metropolitan. It's in the Museum of Modern Art. The Whitney has a large holding. Smithsonian um, and the National Gallery all have very large holdings of her work. Um, Okay. Wait, there's another, Larry, there's another question. Sure. Before you go on. Autumn leaves appear as though it is two dimensions over a glass, over a glass with continuing, with continuing the design. Um, autumn leaves. Yeah, autumn leaves, well, well, what it is, is is she would she would stain the under underpainting, okay? So there's this blue that's underneath there that was stained first onto the canvas, and then and then she came in with the acrylic. One of the things that these guys were working with now, Alma, unlike unlike a lot of the others, like Morris Lewis and and um, Kenneth Nolan, were working with Magna this stuff called magna paint and it was it was a type of acrylic that would mix with um they would mix with turpentine and it would give them a certain kind of luster um alma i believe worked straight with with the acrylics you know by 1960 they had developed um the acrylic paint to a point where it was it was really more um a more developed paint. It was very flexible. Um, you could work it in in a way that was very different from oil paint, where things would dry very quickly. So you could work rapidly over over things without them um, blurring or blending into each other. Um, so, yeah, this piece does have that kind of translucency. It's one of the things about this stuff. It does have that stained glass quality to it. It's got that sense of light passing through the thing and coming, coming, you know, that luminosity that happens through from stained glass is definitely in there. So that, that is a really good point. Um, and again, this beautiful piece, this beautiful 
violet piece, you can see that the underpainting underneath there, that, that blue gray underneath there. Did she work with collage at all? She did work with collage. She did, she did collages. Most of her work is, is in watercolor and, and acrylic, though, though I think she did do collages. Um, and again, we're back to this theme of outer space, Apollo 12, um, you know, this liftoff, this business of, of space travel, this celestial fantasy. Um, she was fascinated by it and, and just the achievement of mankind was just remarkable. Um, and here, here you have a small watercolor sketch. These are tiny, they're like maybe, maybe six by, uh, eight by six inches. So they're, they're relatively small, the sketches that she would do. And then on the, on the right, you have, I think I got the dimension wrong. It's, it, I think it's 72 by 54, but you get where she took that, that, that idea, you know, this, this kind of blast off the nose cone taken off into outer space. And she was right along with it. <laughs> Larry? Yes. Uh, one of the uh, patrons said her work is reminiscent of Kupka, who was quite early yes. on, no? Yeah, um, uh, he, you know, that there's, there's the Delaunay's and the Color School of Paris. Um, um, <clears throat> they, they definitely had an influence on, on her. They definitely had an influence on the American Color School. Um, Robert and Sonia Delaunay, um, would were they um they called it uh synchronism that that was an early development in in the paris school and you can definitely see you know much more of the 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 paris school the joy the the joy of painting the joy of color in in alma's work more than that kind of um uh despair or or aspect of the the um tragic that the that a lot of the abstract expressionists were were playing with there's a lot of anger in 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 that work which is which is fine it's got a place but these pieces are much more buoyant they're much more about the joy of life they're they are um Matisse is 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 definitely definitely a guy who comes into the picture. And these are, you know, two small little gems. Um and and again, Kenneth Nolan did these did these pieces with, you know, straight lines and all that. There's also, you know, Barnett Newman. Again, this was it was very you know, very rigid and all that. Her stuff is much looser, much more, you know, uh, organic, allowing, allowing things to wobble and wiggle around and stuff like that. But nonetheless, she was, she was watching and taking it in. And this, just this buoyant, monochromatic Jonquil, uh, it's, it's a, it, you know, she did, she did a lot of these smaller pieces on paper. Um, I think this one's on canvas, but, but, um, she was just constantly working at this stuff and working with it. And now, you know, here we are, Scarlet Sage dancing a whirling dervish. You know, this lady, this is two years before her death. I mean, she died in 1978. Um, this, is a, this is a lady who's up there, but she's still with that kind of buoyant, um, active, uh, rhythmic color. Um, 
and and form you know basically her use of the the whites throughout these pieces the way she plays the rhythm of that white and and they're they're drawn on before beforehand she does do uh pencil line drawings and things like that but there's there's not much going back over these once she starts painting them she'll come back with some white and some spots i've seen that where she'll come back and and open things up again and things but a lot of this was was really very spontaneous the mark making is really fresh and all of that um so um again i've got the phillips collection in fall of 2021 that's what it's scheduled to do right now there's there is a youtube the washington color school with this david uh gareth who is a really he's a halfway decent lecturer he gets a little gossipy for me and a little parochial but hey you know uh it, it, it it's it's a good it's a good talk so if you want to tune into a uh a further talk that expands on the Washington Color School and takes it into relationship with what was going on with the color field painters in, in New York. Um, this expands it a little bit further. Um, so what what we're what we're gonna do next week. Well oh, excuse me okay, before go you go on. Yes. Some of her paint <coughs> excuse me, terrace almost looked like brickwork, an urban spin on Byzantine mosaic art. Yeah, there, I, I can see that. I mean, you know, basically there, there is that. Um, it, you know, uh, unlike, unlike many of the, of her, the contemporary black artists that were around her, she really did not deal with the the street level you know the 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 politics and all of that were kind of <clears throat> out of the picture for her um she really wanted to paint the the joy of life and 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 all of that but but it it definitely you could see that uh architectural element being in her work um, let me see. I, I know I've got some quotes here from her that are kind of fun. Um, let's see if I can find it. No, not there. Okay. Uh, nah, can't dig them up now. <laughs> anyway, next week we're going to, we're going to take a visit to uh, the Morgan Library, and there's a wonderful artist there called Betty Star. Betty Sar. Um, and uh, the name of the show is Call and Response. Um, and she is a real major voice. She's she does um, collage, mixed media pieces, uh, and painting. Um, and then the other show that's on at the Morgan is, is, uh, the book of Ruth, which is really kind of dealing with, um, a, there's social issues that are touched on in this kind of anonymous book in the Bible called the book of Ruth. Um, and it, it really touches on famine and flight. Uh, immigration, um, foreignness are things which are dealt with in the in the Book of Ruth. So I think you know a lot of this you know in in next week's piece are going to be relevant to things that are going on now in our society. Um, so that will be then, and and the week after we're going to go to the Yale Museum which I'll talk more about next week. <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is an artist I've never even seen. I mean, it's amazing. 
Um, every, uh, lots of thank yous coming in and everybody loves it. Great. They, and a lot of people have never seen this before. So Larry, we're opening our, our eyes to artists we've never seen or heard of. So just terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending.